Hello, can you hear me over there? Okay, great. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, transgender should be allowed to serve in the military is our topic. They start with some definitions. Uh, first of all, transgender, denoting or relating to a person whose sense of personal identity or gender does not correspond to their birth sex. Military, for this debate, we mean the US Armed Forces. Gender dysphoria. People with the gender dysphoria are often experience significant distress and or problems functioning associated with their transgender status. This is a clinical condition. Cisgender, people who are not transgender. Proposed, the US military should not exclude the enrollment of US citizens on the basis of their transgender status alone. Three reasons. First of all, morality. Serving in the military is a high form of patriotism. Encouraging patriotism, patriotic service in your country is a high ideal. If someone is able and willing to serve, we should allow it. If we don't, we're discouraging patriotism for them and setting a bad example for everybody else. The armed forces has a proud history of being on the front line of civil inclusion in America, paving the way for an extending rights and civil liberties. If we truly believe the individual liberty and equality before the law, then we have a moral imperative to allow service by all those able to serve. Many transgender Americans already serve their country honorably in war, and it would be wrong to reject them or disrespect them. Around 11,000 currently serve in the armed forces. It's widely supported. Recent polls say that 68% of American voters and 55% of voters in military households support transgender service. Only 27% of voters said that they opposed it. Marine General Joseph Dunford, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the top general in the US, has openly endorsed transgender service and advised the president against a ban. Recruiting. The military is nearly always looking to recruit. They currently have a recruiting shortage. It would be counterproductive to leave out transgender applicants if they can meet the recruiting standards. It would be expensive to replace those now openly serving. A study in the Naval School of Montgomery found that it would cost $960 million to discharge and replace those now serving. And because transgender rights are now have wide support among American youth uh, who are a prime recruiting demographic, it's important for the military to reflect social values that they can respect. Thus, for the sake of moral action, for democratic support, and for the recruiting needs of the military, transgenders should be allowed to serve in the US military. Um, all right. Uh, first off, I'd like to have no ill will or think less of transgender people, and that I think highly of the men and women in the military. Uh, it's a tough path to take. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that my views are not um, saying someone is not good enough or um, or anything of that nature. I don't want to disparage anyone. I just want to stick to to some solid points that I think I can try to deliver here. Um, I'm concerned about the risks involved to all parties when a cultural change is made to an organization that is responsible um, for protecting our country um, while being accountable to the taxpayers, you know, that are our citizens. Um, so there's also responsibility to those that do enter the military. That would be our soldiers that fight on the front lines. That'll be the enlisted uh, men and women that are tasked with keeping our national secrets um, protected. And the individuals that have placed themselves in this in this role that are fighting their own internal struggles. It's, it's not easy being in the military person in general. So, um, so everyone's kind of has their own struggles to have to take care of, take care of. Uh, there is no denying that transgenderism and enlistment both have an impact on the well-being of individuals. The increased attempts, as well as the increased number of those that do go through a suicide in the transgender community, is it's it's incredibly high when compared to the rest of the population um, that is not part of the transgender community. Um, but the same can also be said to those that are enlisted. There is a higher rate of suicide in the enlisted community compared to those not enlisted. So these are just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, let me think. Um, so enlistment itself also comes with a significant amount of psychological hurdles uh, that individuals must face. Um, there are many factors that go into that go into what causes these psychological um, the psychological turmoil. There is the sleep schedule that changes. There's the diet. There's the stress involved being in the military. Blunt force trauma to the head, mission failure, lots of things that'll discourage them. The general population's perception of the military's involvement, 
uh, the moral struggle of why they're there, are they doing the right thing, the emotional stress of losing individuals uh, they know in combat, and the loss of a support system that they spent their entire life developing once they're deployed or once they're on base, they don't really have that close of a connection immediately available. Uh, so P Oh, yeah, the, the time critter got you. I'll, I'll make a couple of responses. I'll pass the mic back to you pretty quick because I think you have a, a couple more points to make. Um, well, uh, we talked about the, the risks of cultural change and um, it's an important thing to note and, and these things have to be taken into account. The military has, as I said before, a long history of leading the charge in some ways of inclusion in American society. So they've gone through a number of cultural changes before. In the Civil War, they had to include black soldiers uh, into the regiments, which was something that many people were opposed to, but they fought patriotically. They fought well. They earned the respect of other soldiers, and in part, they earned the respect of society. During the Jim Crow era uh, in World War II, black soldiers again served in the military, and when they came home, uh, they realized greater respect um, because they served alongside their white comrades, and people realized that a lot of these Jim Crow and segregation laws were immoral uh, because they were you know, good people. But there was, of course, at the time, uh, plenty of people who uh, complained about integrated units. Uh, when women were introduced into the military, we had these kinds of debates again. And again, the, the military, I'm sure there were some cultural adjustments, but they managed to do well. Uh, and uh, when gay people were uh, allowed to openly serve in the military, again, we had these kinds of complaints. But again, uh, it worked out fine. Of course, there's challenges. There always are. Um, but the military, our military, is the best in the world. And they're up to these kinds of challenges. And they can handle these kinds of social changes. The kind of rigor and stress that you mentioned in boot camp and the kind of training is designed to make people work together as cohesive units and to overcome individual challenges they might have with these kinds of problems. So um, let me read uh, a little bit. This is from a PBS discussing a military study on transgender service, which was performed by the military. And um, uh, the interviewer asked, lastly, uh, and very quickly, I understand that you looked at the experience of 18 other countries. And the general says, yes. Uh, the interviewer says, did any of those nations have problems if they felt they needed to get transgender service members out of their services? The general responded, so we didn't find any readiness or cohesion implications in any of the 18 studies that currently allow this. So I, I think it's something that the military is fully capable of doing and has done in the past. Um, you mentioned the, the stresses that people face in the military, and I think those are pretty well understood. People know that boot camp is a stressful and challenging time when you join the military, and they know that in the military we are at war currently, we have active armed duty people in the field, you can get killed in the military. And that's pretty understood by people who are joining. So um, I, I'm pretty sure that any transgender person that tries to enroll in the military is prepared for the challenges and stress of military life and of combat. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess the last, I guess the last bit of what I was gonna try to say was not was that there are these challenges that people will be facing while in the military and um, while in the military or while being a transgender person in normal society. Um, but when you compound those two together, um, there's, a, there's a significant number of rates that already go through the roof. Um, there's a whole other set of implications of of correctly including the transgender community. And I, you don't want to just say, yeah, sure, we'll take you here, hop right in. But there's a whole process of the whole transitioning that one should take into account and not just let them in because at that moment in time, they're ready. But to look at the long picture of, you know, what kind of psychological effect this will have down the road. You know, we have a, a, a duty to our citizens especially those that want to, to enlist, to make sure that this is something beneficial for them. Um, you know, 41% of the people who identify as transgender will attempt suicide compared to 4.6% 4, 4 that are not part of the transgender community. That's, that's staggeringly higher. That's a lot of people. Um, you compound in the fact that in the military, um, you have men that have never served about 20 in every 100,000 commits um, commit suicide versus the 32 point, you know, slightly something over 32. Um, yeah, in, that, are, that are veterans or active service. That is about a 33% increase in 
in suicide rate. Uh, in women, it's a huge jump. It's a little over five in every 100,000 that have never served in the military that commit suicide. And then it jumps up to 28 in every 100,000 that commit suicide. So these numbers are, you know, huge jumps. And what's causing it is um, not entirely going to translate the same for someone that's in part of a transgender community that has their own issues. They have their own privacy concerns, their own identity um, concerns, hormone balances that need to be, you know, properly, properly set up. You know, there's a, it's a big jump right now for the military as what it is to, to openly say, yes, we'll, we'll bring on this challenge um, to openly bring in um, that many transgenders that would like to, to en enlist. I'm not saying kick out the 11,000 that are in there, but to actually have a full on system to make sure it's done properly. But as of right now, it's not. Well, I'll say this. Uh transgender people can serve in the armed forces openly uh, during the Obama administration towards the end uh, around October they instituted this policy they did a number of studies ahead of time uh, Obama commissioned the studies to uh, examine and find out what uh, the costs would be what the challenges would be and the military created plans in order to address them and then they went ahead and did that so there are openly serving transgender men and women in the military currently, and they have policies in order to accommodate them uh, and in order to integrate them into the regular armed forces. The current proposal is to reverse that decision and uh, ban them. We haven't necessarily seen, now not a lot of time has passed, but we haven't seen an increased rate of suicide among transgender uh, military service people. Uh, so that this, uh, you know, you bring up the idea that, that a number of transgender people have uh, issues with depression and other uh, conditions uh, such as gender dysphoria that uh, lead them to higher suicide rates and then kind of suggest that the, the military also has higher suicide rates, which is well understood. Um, but it's not clear that there's necessarily a cumulative effect. There's different kinds of stresses. Um, it could well be that the stresses of military life can take away or the, the rigorous training can take away some of this concern about gender identity that they may have because they have a focused mission, they have something to attend to. Um, so it's not necessarily clear that the one or the other increases that if you're predisposed to something, the military is going to enhance that or not. Um, be good if you can give us some kind of explanation of maybe how that would work. The military has very strict recruiting standards and they don't uh, accept people who have a history of depression or attempts at suicide or who, who suffer from gender dysphoria or other things. They don't take people who stutter. They don't people with ADHD. Uh, they have a long list of psychological conditions to which they do not accept membership. Uh, and it's very stringent. So those transgender people who would be joining the military would have to pass all of the usual military requirements. It's just they wouldn't be exclusively uh, banned because of the transgender thing. So presumably those who suffer from these kinds of problems who might be uh, not up to the, the mental rigors of military life would be screened out just like any other man or woman who is trying to join the military. Um, since there are plenty of people who are not transgender who have increased risk of depression or already have depression. So I think, um, Generally speaking, you know, we don't want to stereotype people just because you're transgender doesn't mean you're suicidal. Uh, maybe there's a higher rate among the community, but as an individual, we should be able to determine your psychological profile and whether you're fit for military service. And if you are, then you should be able to serve. Okay. Um, so for the vast majority of the transgenders that do meet those rigors and uh, do have the mental capacity. I mean, plenty of them do. Like I said, there's only 40% in their community. So I leave the whole 60% that have not experienced the attempt of suicide or anything like that. Um, so I'm not saying that all of them are, all of them are not. Um, but I'm saying like within their thing, it does predispose that community to a risk. So I just want to put out there that it was worth continuing to investigate just because there is, it's, it's a different thing. It's, it's new. It's, and it should be treated cautiously. I'm not saying to don't bring them in. I'm just saying don't toss them in. Um, just, yeah, just don't toss it in like it's not a big deal. It's it's worth investigating. And, you know, as, as, you've, as you've noted that there have been some studies, but for our military, it is still, it's still new. It's, you know, I guess time will tell with the 11,000 that are currently in there. But, um, but that also leaves out a bunch of the, uh, transgender that want to, to completely transition, that want to be on the hormone blockers, that want 
or that need to continue to do our transition period. Um, you know, military doesn't let people with asthma, diabetes, allergies that require normal medication. Um, so it's not necessarily inclusive. It's saying you can identify with a whole, you know, with being a different gender versus you actually want to be transgendered and be going through this process. Um, I guess that's where our differing on a, a kind of an opinion of what I've interpreted transgender to mean, which you've established your definition earlier on. Um, it's not just the feeling, but because you know you can't really ban someone saying they're feeling what you know that they don't identify with their gender versus someone going through a process to change their gender. The actual, you know, the actual changing portion is is what I was more trying to address in in my points. I'm gonna pass this back to you. Yeah, I think I got you on that. Um, the the resolution is is a little bit open ended, but. Uh, Generally speaking, it is, it is a question of whether or not your status, your identification as a transgender person should on its own exclude you from military service. If there is something about the nature of your transgender experience that makes you unable to serve in the military for one reason or another, because that reason, whatever it happens to be, let's say you have a medical dependency uh, that requires something like diabetes. They don't let people with diabetes into the military. If you develop diabetes while you're in the military, well, they... they continue to allow you to serve so long as you're able to be useful, but they don't allow new people in. So if that's the case, if a transgender person is undergoing surgery currently, they wouldn't let them in. Um, in fact, they have a basically, a, I think it's a 18 month waiting period. So if you've undergone surgery, you would have to wait at least 18 months in order to join the service because you would still be in a period under which you have uh, psychological challenges, social challenges that you're, you're trying to deal with. So they studied this. Uh, they tried to determine the periods of time in which there would be difficulty. Also, if you currently are trying to, if you're just trying to jump into the military to get surgery paid for, that doesn't work either. Either. Um, if they find out that you already, uh, you know, intended to have surgery and you join the military just to get on the fund, they'll kick you out. Um, and they do that with other uh, conditions as well. You're not allowed to join the military just to get your medical bills taken care of. Um, only if somehow this develops while you're in the military uh, and uh, you're already a service member and a certain period of time. Again, uh, there's a number of months of service you have to be in before you can get anything like that covered. Uh, then uh, perhaps they'll, they'll allow you to do that. Um, you know, even before we opened the doors uh, and said that you can serve openly, there were many transgender people in the military already living their lives, taking their hormone therapy, doing the things they had to do kind of on the down low, and they got it done. Uh, and nobody even knew that they were doing it necessarily. So I think uh, it's unreasonable to say that these things uh, are impossible or that they can't be accommodated. And as again, the military studied it very carefully and they've come up with a set of rules, regulations and ideas on exactly how it can be done and how much it will cost. Um, and they've already enacted many of those those programs. So yeah, I, I, it's something that's that's already taken into account. And yeah, not everybody who's transgender gets to be in the military, not everybody who is anybody gets to be in the military. In fact, only like three in 10 of Americans of eligible age are eligible to join the military because the other seven in 10 get excluded for one reason or another. Obesity is the most common factor. Um, so there's a number of situations, medical conditions, and uh, the military has taken these into account in their program. Yep. Okay, yeah, so I mean, it's a good point, and actually I do agree, and I do hear what you're saying. Um, so actually I don't really have a, much of a counterpoint to that. Um, Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no problem. Uh, if if you are out of arguments, you can you can close up. Uh, and um, just you know, uh, if we want to end a debate early, uh, which sometimes happens, what we can do is there's a little end debate button kind of up in the upper right corner. So um, it's traditional that uh, I would give you the last word. But I, um, let me ask you a question, just since we're since you've sort of wrapped up your side of the, the debate. Uh, are you new to call out? Uh, actually, my very first time. Um, got the link. I figured, you know, I'd give it a try and see kind of what would pan out of it. Um, so, yeah, uh, first time call out. Cool. Well, uh, very much welcome. Uh, tournament just 
earlier this week. So don't feel bad <laughs> if you feel like you've run into a little bit of a, a buzzsaw here. Um, um, I do pretty good. Uh, I, I think you've done a, a fine presentation. You had very good points to make. And uh, I think it's uh, very honorable uh, if you come to a point and uh, you don't have further argumentation. You've gone back and forth on everything that's there, but you know, call it a good debate. So uh, thank you very much. And um, appreciate debating with you and best of luck. And I hope to see you more uh, on call out. For sure, I hope I'll uh, maybe we'll uh, have a debate or something again in the future. Maybe our, our paths will cross. <laughs>